In the winter of 1945, the German military blocked food and fuel from reaching four and a half million people in the Netherlands. The resulting famine, now known as the Dutch hunger winter, was devastating. Biologists interested in the impact of the famine wondered if it had any effect on women who were pregnant at the time. What they found is that women who endured the famine late in their pregnancy had small babies, and those children remained small even into adulthood. Women who experienced the famine early in their pregnancy surprisingly had children who became obese at a higher rate than normal. Something about not having enough food early in gestation seemed to make the children more prone to gaining weight. Not having enough food should make it harder for babies to grow. It's surprising that not having enough food would make children obese. It's even more surprising that the grandchildren of mothers in the famine also tend to be obese. How can we explain this complicated story? Scientific understanding of complex systems like the brain or global climate or patterns of obesity typically begins by breaking them into simpler parts and studying each part. Then the parts can be put back together to understand the whole system. But as we learn more, we discover new unexpected parts and complex interactions among the parts, and the ways we put them back together is more complicated than simple addition. So how can we explain what happened in the Dutch hunger winter? Traditionally, biologists appeal to two sources of family similarity, genes and environment, or what we commonly call nature and nurture. For example, being able to roll your tongue is inherited genetically, whereas the bright pink color of flamingos isn't genetic, but rather determined by their diets. Neither traditional understandings of genetic inheritance or environmental factors alone are enough to understand what was going on in the Dutch hunger winter. We need to go beyond the nature-nurture dichotomy. Cases like this have led scientists to suggest a third factor, epigenetics. Epigenetics asks us to step out of the nature-nurture dichotomy and think about the processes that produce a trait. As the Greek prefix epi suggests, epigenetics is looking for new features in addition to the usual genetic basis for a trait. The first scientists to study epigenetics were Victor Yolos and Tracy Sonneborn. In the 1930s, they examined arsenic resistance in paramecium, calling the observed patterns of inherited change dauer modification, German for persisting modification. Yolos and Sonneborn struggled to find a mechanism to explain this persistence. Did the environment cause the genes for arsenic resistance to mutate? Or could there be factors in the cell besides genes that were also inherited? Looking beyond genes alone turned out to be right. A striking example of epigenetic inheritance can be found among tiny freshwater crustaceans called Daphnia. Daphnia's predators, such as small fish, release chemicals caramones into the water. Daphnia sense these molecules and can actually grow helmets in response, making it harder for predators to swallow them. Researchers found that Daphnia mothers who are exposed to predators' caramones not only grow helmets, but their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are born with helmets too, even if none of those descendants were exposed to caramones. Daphnia whose mothers were not exposed are born without a helmet though they can develop one later if they meet a predator. The grandchildren's helmets are not directly caused by predators in the environment. They are inherited, but not by the normal path of the same DNA sequence being passed down from parents to their children. Instead, Daphnia use a different system, an epigenetic system. Recent research on epigenetics has discovered chemical changes like methylation. When a methyl molecule, a single carbon atom bound to three hydrogen atoms, attaches to DNA, the methyl molecule can turn genes on or off, influencing which traits are expressed in the organism. These methyl groups are sometimes passed down from generation to generation just like genes, and organisms with the same genes but different methylation may have very different traits. Epigenetic processes, possibly methylation, explain how Daphnia grandchildren can inherit their helmets. Methylation is definitely implicated in the traits shared among descendants of the hunger winter. 
Biologists found those obese children and grandchildren of mothers who suffered the famine early in pregnancy had 5% more methylation acting on important metabolic genes than children born to mothers who went through the hunger winter later in their pregnancy. Epigenetic changes create lasting heritable effects. What cases like these show is that looking for answers in two established boxes, such as nature and nurture, can be too simple. A third box, epigenetics, is needed to explain why we are the way we are, why we have some traits but not others, and how we got them. But it would be a mistake to simply add epigenetics to genes and environment as a separate explanation for a trait. While the inheritance of some traits can be explained by one cause, most traits are produced by all three factors interacting with each other. So how can we explain what happened in the Dutch hunger winter? If we want to explain obesity, neither your genes nor what you eat is sufficient. Resemblance requires a multi-generational perspective on a set of complex interactions that shape our bodies. What your grandmother ate matters, 